Okay. Welcome everybody to today's eSports Research Colloquium. My name is Oliver Leis, and it's my pleasure to welcome five esteemed individuals who are going to talk about the Bootledge Handbook of eSport Projects. It's this, Jenny, Nico, Besombes, Tom, Brock, Amanda Cote, and Tobias Scholz joining us today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry for the interruption. Um, and in today's session, they will briefly introduce themselves. Then we will listen about insights about the project. And in the end, you and I will have the chance to ask some questions within the Q&A. That's the session for today. To, and to keep it short and to learn as much as possible about the project, I hand over to Veth, Tobias, Nicolas, Amanda, and Tom. The stage is yours. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Ali. Appreciate uh, the invitation to present here. Um, I guess we'll just briefly uh, introduce ourselves. I'm uh, Dr. Seth Jenny. I teach at Slippery Rock University in uh, Pennsylvania in the United States uh, in the Department of Exercise Science and Athletic Training. Um, so that that's me. Wanna, anybody who wants to go next? We follow the, the order on the slide. Oh, so. There we go. Okay, I go next. So, uh, thank you very much, Oli, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be part of uh, this uh, this edition, and I see a lot of familiar faces. So that's really, really a, 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 a good time. Uh, I appreciate it. So, my name is Nicolas Bozom. I'm um, assistant professor uh, in sports sciences department of the University Paris Cité in France. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Nico. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Ali, for the invite. Uh, my name is Tom Brock. I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at Manchester Met, uh, where I write about and teach about uh, esports and games consumer behaviour. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. So nice to see uh, so many familiar faces in the audience. I'm Amanda Cody. I'm associate professor at Michigan State University. Um, in the Department of Media and Information. So I run a collegiate esports research lab and then teach kind of general game studies and game design courses these days. You're muted, Tobias. Yeah. That's embarrassing. <laughs> deep breath, Hello, deep breath. Uh, my name is Phil Scholz. I'm from the University of Akta in Norway nowadays, um, and I'm a professor for academic esports and uh, also yeah, the founding chairperson of the Esports Research Network. Yeah, we have a big broad of experts here, and I'm keen to listen to the project now. So please start. All right, appreciate it. So, uh... <clears throat> We're going to talk about um, this Rutledge Handbook of Esports project, um, how it started, what it is about, what the contents of it are. We're actually also going to introduce who uh, authored the various chapters uh, and then answer questions you might have um, and, and really describe the whole process of how it came to be. So this uh, first, I'm just going to talk about how, how it, it the original uh, project got started. Um, I uh, peer reviewed a, a book proposal for Rutledge. Um, it was an esports related topic. And uh, when I sent it back, um, the editor uh, from Rutledge uh, approached me and asked me um, if I was interested in, in taking lead on a the Rutledge handbook of esports. Um, that is, Rutledge has a handbook series. Um, they are a broad overview of the topic. Um, they're not meant to be an exhaustive, hyper detailed um, investigation with uh, empirical new studies being presented. It is more of like in a literature um, overview of a topic. And that's what this project um, is really focused on is what is esports across the entire ecosystem, thinking about all the various facets and interdisciplinary-ness of esports um, from a 30,000 foot view. And so um, the first thing after uh, I accepted that was uh, organized uh, associate editors um, and, and it 
these were purposeful selections. Um, we wanted a global perspective. Uh, we wanted people from various uh, backgrounds, both professionally and geographically. And so um, you can see the list there and and their, um, where they're from. Um, ironically, Nico's the only author from France in this uh, project. So um, I, I don't know what that says about Nico, but it's an interesting fact. <laughs> um, Anyway, so uh, yeah, Nico had exercise science and social science background. Tom Brock is a strong um, social science background, editorial uh, work, same with, with uh, Amanda. Um, she has a strong media and communications background, diversity, equity, and inclusion background. And then um, Tobias, who I like to call the, the godfather of esports research. Um, and he actually changed affiliations across this project. So that's why he's got two flags on there. And so with that, um, we actually met six times to simply discuss what would be in this book. So we probably put in, I would say, eight to nine hours of simply discussing the outline of the book and what the proposal would be, um, because it is a very broad topic and we wanted to um, cover things in a way that hasn't been done before. If you think about the books that are out there in esports research, there's the esports um, medicine handbook, esports business management, uh, there's collegiate esports books. So they all tend to focus on a specific sector of esports. And this is this broad overview. And so it was important for us to try to include as much as we possibly could. Uh, and so from June to August of 2022, we worked on the proposal and we submitted, it was a 20 page proposal in September and Rutledge collects that. And then they do a blind peer review process of the proposal. I think it was sent to four reviewers. And here was, um, I'm, I, I'm going to select some individual review feedback that we thought was, um, interesting. Uh, so obviously, you know, if you've ever taught in higher education, you always think about the negative co student comments that you get. And so we're going to highlight the negative comments that we got on our proposal. Reader A said, it's ambitious. 50 contributors and five editors. That's a lot of review and editorial work, plus additional editor written contributions. So um, yeah, we agree with that. It should be noted that this is an incredibly ambitious project and overreaches in several places. That um, you might see what we present here today and you might still think that, um, but I, I think we, what we've done is, is achievable. Reader D, a little bit more critical. Section two is a book. Sections four, five, and six are another book. Sections three, seven, and eight, and nine are a different book. And so uh, when we broke down the, uh, the various sections, he said, um, there, we're tr trying to cover way too much. Um, the way that Rutledge also sets these up is each chapter, uh, shouldn't be more than 5,000 words. And for, uh, academics who are used to writing manuscripts that are anywhere from eight to 10,000 words, um, it, it is difficult to try to cover a topic in that amount of space. Um, authors want to include all the information in one book and that's not possible is the way that that reviewer concluded. So throughout this process, we uh, introduced and presented our um, book ideas at the Esports Research Network number two, which was in um, Sweden, uh, Jönköping University. And we solicited uh, feedback, we solicited authors interest, we solicited peer reviewer interest, and we also, created a um, online survey to collect that information. And uh, we received, uh, to date, we're actually higher than 124 responses. So there was massive interest globally uh, on this project for, and we, you know, I think that says a lot for um, esports researchers. You know, people are, are wanting to get involved. Um, there's a lot of eager people who are wanting to get onto these projects. And, for this particular um, project, um, there is a lot of interest. So this is an overview of the 
outline. Things change slightly. Maybe a, there's a few title changes for these chapters, but we're going to talk about each of these sections uh, individually. And the section editors of each section is going to describe it a little bit more, as well as introduce the authors of each section. So did I miss anything so far? If anybody else wants to chime in. No. All right. So just as another uh, way to show you the scope of this project, um, there's 93 different authors. That is the alphabetical listing of the authors by last name. So I'm going to pass it over to Nico. And if you want to describe section one introduction to esports, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Uh Maybe what what I can add for regarding the, the introduction that you made is the fact that since the beginning, we wanted to be very transparent about the way we wanted to uh, involve all the community, the sports research community with in this project. And uh, we we were really, really looking to um, have the um, um, the benevolence of all the researchers to involve them, to show them that we are not trying to gatekeep this project for ourselves and to make it the more inclusive as possible. Uh, that's why since the beginning and during Yen Shopping, uh, that the, the ERN conference that was hosted by Brian, uh, we really wanted to uh, show to everybody um, what were our what was the project, what was the outline, but also that we were open-minded to uh, uh, other propositions and to uh, uh, change a little bit slightly the, the, uh, the different contribution that we can have. Um, so the idea, as uh, already mentioned, it is to have a, a broad overview of the, the different aspects of all the esports ecosystem and, of course, we couldn't start uh, this book without speaking about an introduction to esports and especially a definition to esports. So it has been uh, a, a real pleasure to ask Nipomuk, uh, not helper, and to work with Nipomuk about this specific uh, first chapter uh, to uh, first create an inventory of all the definition that has been made. Uh, so uh, now systematic literature review about the definition of esports, uh, and we try to identify uh, the different criteria that are used the most in the literature, and also to propose our own definition that will of course, uh, be the, the line, the pathway in all the book uh, to be sure that we are all speaking about the same thing. So it was mostly about the definition of esports and also the spelling of esports, just to uh, standardize um, all these uh, aspects in all the book. And the second chapter, or the chapter of three, is uh, the global history of esports. We decided it has been quite a discussion between us because we know that esports is very cultural and that the history of esports is very different from a geographical area from another. So uh, there is a, a section dedicated to uh, all the, the cultural aspect of esports that Amanda is leading, and she will uh, explain it a little bit uh, later. So, but we we wanted to have this global history of esports, and we thought that Dalion Jin could be, uh, and we are really happy that he accepted to uh, to to lead this chapter. So it's mainly um, the main uh, milestone that the esports ecosystem slash industry has achieved from the uh, late sixties to uh, to our day. Um, of course, when we are speaking about the esports industry, the esports ecosystem, we are speaking about different stakeholders. So, uh, Jose Augustin Carrillo Vera and Marco Santon from Spain both decided to take care of this specific chapter. They managed to do a great, great uh, 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 work on this because there are many ways to present the, this ecosystem. Uh, to present the different stakeholders. It's uh, very difficult for people that are not familiar with esports and even for people that are 
working on esports or working in esports to uh, actually manage to uh, oversee all the different kind of stakeholders and how they are uh, linked to each other. Uh, and this is uh, what Jose and Marcos have done very uh, brilliantly. Um, of course, esports, as you all know, it is an umbrella term that is divided or subdivided in many genres and many, many games that are very different. Every year, there are new games and new genres that are emerging. Um, and so uh, we wanted to have a specific chapter on it. So uh, Russell um, Hammer from the United States and I decided to um, propose some definition for all uh, this kind of genre. So the first part was to find a good methodology to distinguish the different genre of games. And after that, to, uh, of course, define them, to give some examples. Um, it has been a, a very, I, I would say, a funny work to do because we are speaking a lot of games. So it was really um, interesting to discover new games, new uh, new way to classify them. So, um, yeah, I go a little bit faster. Sorry, Seth. Uh, so this is uh, the chapter about the genre and the game. After that, there is a uh, major stakeholders in esports. E it's all, uh, of course, the, the publishers. And uh, we, as you can see, there are people that are coming from the research community, but also people that are coming from the, the industry. This is the case for Graham Ashton, who was the, a former journalist for uh, uh, the um, esports observer and who is now uh, uh, working uh, for Riot Games at the European level. And uh, he was the guy who was who has all the the expertise to speak about and to talk about the. Um, the publishers and he asked us to uh, uh, add some game design consideration. This is for from the, its own will to add this uh, this last part. Uh, so it's very focused on the industry. And the last one, and we are really happy to have Daniel Rook and Raymond Pastore uh, about the equipment and the infrastructure. Uh, as you all know, and Tobias is the first one to say it, it's uh, uh, the esports is the mirror of our digitized society. And of course, we are speaking about a lot of digital tools, and this is the main topic for this last chapter. Yeah, Daniel worked for Dell and Ray, Ray uh, is coming from the uh, United States. The section two is about esports research. This is our uh, our section. This is for us. Uh, there are many, many things to say about esports research, and we wanted to, to make it the more uh, practical as possible. So the chapter number two, so the first chapter uh, dedicated to uh, the current status and the key topics that we can find in the esports research community. Uh, it has been written by Bradley Baker, Benjamin Sharp and Seth. Um, they are trying to make an overview, uh, a literature review about all the kind of topics and disciplinary field that are involved into esports research. The uh, second chapter called the number three esports research organizations, labs, slash centers, and journals are really uh, a practical tool for all the researchers that are trying to find what are the major and the main organization for esports research, what are the main labs of centers dedicated to esports research, and should they be from the academic side or from the industry side, and also all the journals in which you can publish. So, Seth, Brendan, Harris, Tobias, and I try to make an, a very global inventory. And it's not, we try to make it the most exhaustive as possible, but of course, maybe some are missing, but we asked a lot of people from the eSports Research Network to um, help us, to give us some, some names that maybe we were missing. The next chapter is about general recommendation for esports research. It has been written by Mark Campbell from Limerick, Thefts, Sarah Cregan, and Tim Smith. Um, it's really, as I said, practical. What are the main recommendations if you are a young researcher, a student, or a, an expert researcher to um, address uh, this topic and how you can uh, uh, create the the the, better, uh, the best way to address this topic in the the academic way, uh, and after we we split this question about qualitative research and quantitative research. So there is a chapter dedicated 
to the qualitative esports research methodology that has been written by Amanda, Maxwell Foxman, and Yingying Lao. Uh, so dedica dedicated to, of course, uh, uh, interviews, observation, ethnographics, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, the other one is more dedicated to questionnaire, so questionnaire survey in esports research methodology. It has been written by Joseph Macy and Joe Hamari. Uh, from uh, Finland, and the last one, who has been which has been written by Joan Donoyu from uh, New York uh, Institute of Technology and Peter Varga. Uh, hi, Peter. I, I, I know that you are here uh, from uh, the industry side. Uh, is dedicated most mo mostly about experimental and intervention esports methodology. So, as you can see, we try to address all the way that you can do esports research and to give some tools that can be used by all the community from uh, undergraduate students, postgraduate students to, uh, um, I would say, uh, researchers that with their own expertise. Sorry if I've been too long, Seth. It's all good. So uh, then, we, you know, we wouldn't have esports without the players and we wanted to have a specific section dedicated to esports players. And, um, the first uh, main chapter beyond the introduction is esports players. It's a little bit funny because that's the name of the section, but it is sort of what is involved with an esports player. What it, what does uh, a player's life look like? Um, you know, as far as practice, as far as that uh, process, what are the demands put on an esports player? Not just from the uh, playing standpoint, but from the sponsorship from uh, streaming, those other types of, of of life demands. And so we this is where we paired an academic with uh, a, a former professional player um, in uh, uh, the for that chapter. Performance skills, we wanted a section, um, we were gonna sort of embed this within the coaching chapter, but we decided to separate it out where we wanted to make sure that um, people understand that esports is not just uh, digi, 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 right, Toby? Um, who was that? Who was just saying that? <laughs> oh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna uh, name drop. There are people out there who are very adamantly against whether esports is a sport, and we're gonna get into that. But they, uh, this chapter is all about what are the skills required to to perform esports at a high level, and um, that was purposeful inclusion in the book. Player analytics is one of these things that um, I'm certainly not an expert at, but we have a few people that are, that are going to discuss uh, in this chapter, how can you utilize some of the metrics and data collected from uh, gameplay to enhance performance? Uh, and then we have um, Matthew Watson and uh, Taylor Johnson uh, from industry and academia to uh, and myself to talk about esports coaching. Uh, th then moving into um, Ollie's chapter on esports psychology, Laura and Callum, and they discuss um, and really took an applied approach to um, sports psychology and how can you apply components of that into um, esports. Then moving into Gamer Doc, uh, led the chapter, uh, Lindsay, on uh, health and wellness. That was a chapter that certainly could have been 20,000 words easily. And she really had to work a lot to compress that down to 5,000. I think we gave her an extra thousand words or so. Um, but that's a really important process, um, especially for sustainability of esports. Uh, then we've got uh, one HP um, people here, Caitlin and Kevin, uh, discussing ergonomics and injuries. And then this is a unique chapter that we wanted in there, uh, esports uh, player parental and family support. So how do you across the lifespan from the youth level up to the pro level um, support an esports player? And we have uh, uh, Carol who uh, teaches in academia, but her son uh, is, a, is a professional esports player. So it was a really unique perspective that she brings to that. And then uh, we wanted a chapter about the whole career process of how do you go from uh, enjoying and, and um, getting better at uh, esports to getting into the um, professional level and then what happens when you're done playing what are your options and that's uh, Will um, from USC uh, South Carolina taking um, that chapter over.
Yeah, and uh, next, uh, business and management. As we all know, esports is about business. And we are currently in esports winter, the more so we know how important it is. Um, but that's the reason why this uh, chapter is also um, quite interesting um, to get into the focus. And we got a lot of uh, really, really interesting people in there. Um, for example, especially esports, business and finance with Petra Pavlakov and Angel Barayas. Um, probably butchered the name, but especially I'm really happy about that Petra is uh, involved in that because he did a lot of research on financial aspects in esports and got a good view on that. And for sure, the idea of management, what management actually means in esports, um, we all know how uh, difficult it can be to manage an esports organization, uh, tournament organization and everything like that. Uh, and it, there are differences to other uh, management fields. And that is where uh, Dina Gentile uh, from the US talked about it. Um, next, um, we have the Swedish gang talking about event and tournament management. Uh, I think I saw Brian somewhere here in there, yes. Um, they are talking uh, all about the idea, okay, how to do an event, how to do a tournament. And um, that is something, especially for a broad audience, um, quite relevant for them to, to learn how to deal with that, uh, especially Martin and Victor are involved in the esports landscape. So they are practitioners um, and have a long standing history of doing tournaments. Um, and that is something where we got a lot of insights in that. Uh, next one, uh, venue design and venue management. There we got Sky from Hawaii, uh, which I'm really happy about that because he has this unique perspective of creating a collegiate esports uh, environment at a location like Hawaii, but at the same time has to organize or had to organize the Overwatch finals uh, in the COVID time. And uh, he has this unique perspective on, okay, how to do it on a small scale and on a big scale. Uh, so he gives a lot of insights there. Um, hospitality and tourism, uh, more the Spanish Argentinian group um, surrounding Leandro Becker and uh, some other people. I'm not trying to say them, uh, but um, they have a really good look at the idea. Okay, what can we do? Um, how? are cities dealing with the idea of integrating uh, esports in their city. We all know um, cities like Katowice. Uh, nobody knew that before of esports. Now everybody knows that uh, same somewhat for you in shopping as well. Um, and that's quite interesting as well. Um, for branding and marketing, uh, we got Brian and Bradley Baker. Uh, which is also really great as they have the perspective and they have the marketing background. Um, it's still something where uh, you have to understand how marketing goes in order to do it in esports. And even though it sounds relatively close, uh, branding, marketing, and sponsorship, sponsorship definitely also a different topic, but extremely important in esports we all know it uh, i mean depending on the numbers you are choosing 80 percent of revenue from revenue from esports teams comes from sponsorship money terrible sustainable business model but it is what it is uh, luckily we got anthony pizzo and david hadland to uh, give an insight uh, how to deal with that and how to uh, work with that esports Public relations, also something where, uh, I mean, you just have to look what happens with the British Esports Federation at the moment and how they are dealing with it uh, or how they even thought about uh, doing that in the way they are presenting it. Uh, PR disaster. Um, 
despite the, the um, topic, but it is a PR disaster. So there is a lot to learn from that. And we have with Kevin Mitchell and Jana Möglich and Alan Ritako a good mix out of uh, people from the business, people who did PR, but are also part of an uh, academic environment. And finally, uh, my background is in HR. So um, the most important chapter of the book, uh, just kidding, uh, at least for me, it's the most important and most special one. Uh, because I was lucky to write it with my colleagues, Pia Busica, Gianluca Vitale, Matthias Ruland, and Friederike Lenke. And it's the real pleasure of um, talking about HR in esports. Uh, we all know how many layoffs were made in the recent months and years. Uh, where, like, if you do, would have done just a good HR calculation of how many people you do need, you may not uh, would have fired them. And there are terrible stories where like uh, some got hired uh, and a week later they got fired. Okay, that's only possible in the US, but still a terrible thing. So obviously eSports also has a huge branch of outreach and promotion, both on the business side, but also in terms of coverage of eSports and eSports events. So that's what the media and communication section focuses on. Um, so again, trying to balance uh, academic work with people who are in the industry. Um, our esports journalism chapter was led by Jacob Wolf, a uh, former reporter for ESPN and founder of Overcome Media, with a slight bit of editorial assistance at the end here from me, because Jacob's busy getting married. So if you know him and see him, tell him congratulations. Um, our esports production and streaming esports chapters here were also really great. Uh, the authors of these chapters preemptively connected with one another to make sure that they kept their chapters separate and distinct. Uh, so esports production focuses a lot more on the setting up of broadcast technology, what you need to do that, whereas the streaming focuses a lot more on platforms. And so the authors for this uh, esports production, Matt Knudsen, is now a professor at the University of North Dakota. He just moved and has still turned his chapter in on time, which is very impressive. Um, and Jonathan Liebig, who is an industry professional in Germany, right, Tobias? Yes, I may be wrong on that. Um, Jason Smethers runs a collegiate esports league at the University of Tennessee in the United States, and so he does a lot of streaming and promotion for his students. That's what he covers in the streaming esports chapter. Um, esports spectatorship, what is the role of fans? Why do people watch esports rather than just participating? That's covered by Tanya Valasalo, Tom Brock, and Ying Yang Law. And then our last chapter in this section, esports fandom, focuses on the, the practices and processes of being an esports fan from going to tournaments to watching online to things like cosplay. And Josh Jarrett from the United Kingdom wrote that chapter for us. Your mute, Seth. Thank you. <laughs> Couldn't let Toby be the only one to do that. Um, this is the uh, one of the shortest sections, esports education. Uh, the, the first uh, main chapter here, esports education, is about the academic side of esports. So um, from the primary, uh, secondary, and higher education levels, how people are integrating esports curriculum into educational environments. And then uh, moving into 6.3 discusses uh, collegiate competitive teams. So uh, varsity club level uh, esports competitive teams in those settings um, in a higher education setting. And then 6.4 uh, by Miles Harvey here discusses competitive building and maintaining a competitive esports team at the primary or secondary level, what we would call, uh, you know, middle school, um, high school level. And you can see the authors there, uh, very diverse within uh, the collegiate setting with um, Michelle King and Leandro bring a lot of practical experience with both um, creating a collegiate um, teams at their respective United States and Argentinian uh, University and, and Maxwell Fox and as well took the lead on that chapter. Hi everyone. Um, so section seven, uh, critical concerns. So this section of the handbook uh, covers the complex challenges and critical concerns within esports uh, that warrants further research and examination. Um, this was a heavily subscribed to section of the book. Um, 
and it probably doesn't cover all of the critical concerns that we have there out there about esports, uh, particularly in the current uh, environment. But the major kind of focus is on eight areas uh, covering esports governance and esports law, esports in the esports in the Olympics, esports in the esports, esports in the Olympics, esports gambling, uh, ethics and cheating in esports. Uh, toxicity in esports, diversity and inclusivity, or inclusion in esports, and the esports for people with disabilities, and then esports sustainability. Uh, to go into a little bit of depth about them, so in chapter 7.2, um, esports governance and law, uh, Kevin Sabasa uh, argue that uh, the rapid growth of esports has kind of really outpaced its regulatory mechanisms and that this has led to a new set of unique governance challenges uh, in digital sports more generally. Uh, they in particular focus on uh, the relationship between video game developers and publishers and the role of third party organizers and begin to uh, argue or examine kind of some of the unprecedented control that uh, developers and publishers have over their intellectual property and the challenges that this has for how competitions are run. There's a lot more, but I'll just give you that snippet. You have to buy the book or get the library to buy it to find out more. Uh, in 7.3, uh, esports in the Olympics, uh, Seth, Sam, and Nico uh, delve into the relationship between the esports and Olympic Games. Obviously, the role of esports in the Olympics is a burgeoning question um, and has been for a little while now. Um, and so they begin to kind of chart the kind of historical push for esports inclusion and, and, and trace kind of the role of, of esports and virtual sports within kind of the framework of the Olympic movement. Uh, they draw on a number of sources, including an interview uh, with uh, Vincent Pere is it Pereira? Pereira? Pereira. Um, uh, the IOC's head of virtual sport, um, just to give a kind of balanced view on the topic um, and kind of begin to map out the road ahead and, and give us a sense of, of, of whether or not we'll actually see sports in the Olympics, uh, particularly um, with the possibility of it being included in the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Uh, in 7.4, so that's my chapter with uh, Mark Johnson, so esports gambling. Um, just very briefly, uh, me and Mark basically make the argument that, um, as many of you are probably aware, gambling has become an increasingly important part of esports. And so we break gambling into three kind of major areas. We talk about issues around loot boxes, which some of you are probably quite familiar with. We also talk about issues around skin betting and skin gambling um, and the relationship that has with problem gambling and match fixing. And then we go into some of the kind of scandals that have been generated around this and some of the leg regulatory uh, responses and results as well. Uh, in the chapter, we also begin to consider how new technologies from live streaming, uh, NFTs um, and, uh, and fantasy sports as well kind of further complicates the regulatory framework um, and our understanding of, of what's taking place around gambling in esports. Uh, in 7.5, um, ethics and cheating, uh, Will um, looks at or makes the argument that the integrity of any sport uh, relies around ideas of fair competition. And this sport, and this is no different in the context of esports, uh, Will goes on to suggest that challenges, uh, that cheating challenges the very foundation of competitive esports, but actually then tries to provide a critical analysis of what cheating involves. Uh, recognizing the fact that cheating doesn't exist in a silo. Uh, there are socio sociological, economic conditions uh, that actually can justify um, or at least uh, explain uh, the reasons why people cheat. And so in this sense, um, uh, Will actually provides a much broader contextualization of the reasons why people cheat and actually why people uh, endorse and actually, uh, as in, in fans, can actually accept under certain circumstances uh, why people cheat in certain contexts. Um, in 7.6, uh, toxicity in esports, uh, Julian and Regan. Um, consider how the rise of competitive um, games has brought unique challenges in terms of how we understand and manage negative behaviours online. Uh, they actually go into a very in-depth consideration of what the notion of toxicity actually means, what this term toxicity as a concept actually serves. Uh, they refer to it as an umbrella term for various kind of harmful and, and unwanted actions and start to kind of map out how different organizations from the Fair Play Alliance, Anti-Defamation League, so forth and so on, have uh, really made strides in trying to categorize and regulate toxic behaviors 
um, in, in games, although it, 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 it's clear that no universal kind of accepted solutions uh, still exist to today. Uh, in this sense, uh, Julian and Regan begin to consider the role of certain technologies like AI moderation and so forth and so on, and, and the role that they might play in creating uh, safer environments. Um, in 7.7, .7, diversity and inclusion in esports, um, uh, Maria, Uzva and Matilda uh, examine how esport cultures alienate and discriminate against women and other minorities. Uh, they argue that esports cultural histories uh, kind of continue to perpetuate uh, problematic structures and issues within esports, uh, particularly around stereotypical Im images of the esports athlete as white, uh, cisgender and as a heterosexual male. In chapter 7.8, uh, esports for people with disabilities, uh, Lobner, Polina and Marcus um, examine the challenges and pathways uh, towards thinking about how we might actually accommodate people with disabilities in esports. Uh, they examine definitions of, of disability to begin with in the context of esports and actually kind of reject or at least are very critical about medical models that often fail to appreciate the complexities and inter, uh, intersecting factors that shape uh, esports players' experiences of disability um, in those contexts, particularly with regards to their socioeconomic status, their race, their gender, and so forth and so on. Um, they look to the Paralympics and other uh, uh, events and, org um, and organizations in order to begin to think about ways in which we can actually create uh, more diversity and inclusion. And in this, in this sense, uh, have uh, a relationship or an overlap with some of the discussions taking place in chapter 7.7. .7. And then finally, in chapter 7.9, uh, uh, Julia and Jana uh, talk about esports sustainability. Uh, they position esports in the context of kind of quite gloomy uh, social, economic and environmental crises, um, arguing that we need uh, a clearer, more definitive role of corporate social responsibility, particularly on the behalf of esports organisations, um, and how that will play a crucial role in contributing solutions to these crises. Uh, they consider the increasing significance of CSR in shaping the future of uh, business practices in esports, and then highlight some of the key sustainability challenges that esports organisations and the industry at the whole, in the whole, uh, need to invest in and, and, and deal with. That's it. And the last uh, section that we recruited a lot of authors for was again kind of uh, giving people an impossible task. Uh, so to talk about global esports cultures, we recruited authors from different regions of the world and then asked them to please sum up the whole history and functioning of esports in their region, uh, which I'm sure all of you are thinking right now that that's very difficult to do. Um, they did a fantastic job uh, trying to sum up the key points of these, and we attempted to provide some consistency between chapters by suggesting a, a set of tables that all of our authors filled out, focusing on things like key esports leagues, tournaments, or events that happen within the region, uh, key developers or publishers from that region, the most significant or popular esports titles, and then any esports specific venues that exist within that region. So starting with esports culture in Africa and the Middle East, um, an area where there's really not a lot of research, um, Hashem Alborno and Yasmin Mokhtar from Egypt wrote that section for us. Both of them are working esports professionals running esports uh, leagues and tournaments in that region. For esports culture in Asia, Ye Wan Jin and Seijie Kim wrote that chapter for us, summing up both the um, historical esports culture in places like Korea, which is of course what a lot of the, us think about first, but also paying attention to the growing role of esports in places like Southeast Asia. So comparing and contrasting a lot of different parts of that region. Esports culture in Europe, again, a very difficult one to sum up. Uh, Raina Koskama did a fantastic job of trying to pay attention to the different regions within Europe where esports exists. Um, esports culture in Oceania, so Australia, New Zealand, but also places like Indonesia. Uh, David McAuliffe and Jessica Formosa from Australia took the lead on that chapter. Esports cultures in North America, we have um, US and Canadian based scholars here, Ben Scholl and Bryce Stout. And then finally, esports culture in South America, um, Tercizio Macedo, Gabriela Kurtz and Leandro Becca wrote that chapter from uh, Brazil and Argentina. So we really did our best to reach out globally and try and get insider perspectives on these regions, 
even knowing we were giving the authors a very difficult task to try and sum up the whole area. Yeah, and finally, uh, the future of esports. Um, for sure, is something you will all want to know, but uh, no spoilers, you have to read the book. <laughs> all right, so um, I'm going to quickly go through this because I want to try to leave a little bit of time for um, some questions at the end, but uh, we are very purposeful in our um, diversity when we selected um, authors. Uh, here you can see the breakdown of gender. So this was self-reported by the authors. So almost a third of the authors uh, were women. 93 different authors came from 27 unique countries. Uh, some of them re represented more than one country. So uh, they may have been originally from one country and then they teach and work maybe in another country. So there are uh, 19 authors that represented more than one country. This is the regions which the authorship of the book, those 93 authors represent. So it's certainly, um, the book's in English, if you didn't know. <laughs> so that limits a little bit from people, uh, but we did our best to try to pull from various parts of the world. Here's a breakdown of uh, more specific countries. And you can see the 24 in Europe and the next slide covers for you Europeans exactly where in Europe the breakdown came from. So Germany and the UK win that title there. And uh, this was unique. Um, we did do a peer review process. The chapter was sent at least to five different reviewers and with the hope of getting at least two back in return. Um, we, at this point, this is without the introduction chapters. So we set, we had 52 chapters. It was set to a total of 281 uh, reviewers. So we had a couple chapters that it went to 10 different reviewers because people don't respond and then we need to move on to the next person. And especially like the law chapter, the people are like, Hey, I get paid $300 an hour. I'm not doing this. So then we had to send the law chapter to like 10 people. Um, but our response was pretty awesome. Um, we had an, on average, each chapter was reviewed um, by at least two different reviewers, but uh, it was sent to at least five reviewers Here's our response rate. So we had 162 reviews returned. That's a 57% a response rate, which is pretty awesome. And the average number of reviews for each chapter was three. Some chapters, all five people responded. So people like Ollie got a little bit irritated with us because they had got five reviews sent back on the, on the psychology chapter, for example. Um, but that, I think, really has strengthened our book because especially these reviewers came from all over the world. So they brought in a lot of different diverse perspectives that um, people didn't necessarily think about because you're you know, focused from, from your own perspectives. So here's the reviewer demographics. Uh, there were 149 different reviewers from 30 different countries. Uh, 15 of those reviewers represented more than one country. Uh, we also asked uh, their self-reported gender. So we had, um, again, a pretty decent representation across the genders. Here are the regions in which the reviewers came from. And this is all information I'm hoping to put into the preface of the book to, to keep a, a record of this. And here are the countries in which the reviewers came from. We got a few more from uh, Asia there. And here are the European specific countries of where the reviewers came from. A lot from Turkey there. So we definitely want to thank everybody because I know there's a lot of people on the call that were involved in this project, both reviewers and authors. So this project wouldn't happen without everybody's support. So we appreciate all that you've done. Um, this was from chapter 2.3. I'm just going to throw it up here. This is an example information about ERN because this is an ERN colloquium. Um, so we had in 2020 when ERN was started with 50 members, July, December 2021, we are up to 350 members. And then April 2023, 
um, this is where the ERN membership um, is at. So uh, for some of you that are interested in ERN uh, and you're not a member, uh, Google us and, and fill out the request form. We'd love to have you. Oh yeah, Brian's chiming in on there. August of 2023, we're up to about 490 members. You can see the locations. All right. Hopefully we weren't too long-winded. There's a lot of information to cover. We'd love to answer questions. There was Ollie, actually a you question haven't... in the yeah. chat earlier about where officiating is. And part of that is covered in the esports cheating chapter, um, how officiating can be used to stave off cheating. And I believe some of it is also in the tournament management chapter, but the editors of that section can speak to that a little more. So it is in there. A lot of topics like that are spread through multiple chapters, depending on where they're relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the valuable insights into your project. And if I have to summarize it in one word, it would be impressive. Having having so many authors from different cultures, uh, countries, nationalities, and yeah, it's it's impressive. And I like that you, yeah, searched, uh, made a made an open call for the eSport Research Network and above to include people working on different chapters. And you ended up with a bunch, or like broad array of experts who worked on different topics. And yeah, I love it already, and I can't wait to read the book uh, in summer 2024, if I remember correctly. And if I have, if I have the chance to share something before we move into the q and I, I was an author for this, um, this applied sport psychology chapter in the overarching chapter of eSport players. We can see what you're doing. That's okay. Um, yep. And it was really hard to cut down what we wanted to express within our chapter in 5,000 words, but it helped us to reflect on our topic in a different way, it helped us to transform the key ideas because we can't cover everything within a book. And I think that helped not only our chapter, but also other chapters to narrow it down to the most essential information. And I think at least from the reviews I I did and the chapters I read, that it will be a really beneficial and valuable uh, resource for the not only esports environment, but maybe also a broader audience. So that's being said, I want to remove my questions. I uh, want to move my questions toward the end of the section and allow the audience to ask their questions first. If there are any, please um, feel free to unmute your microphone or put your questions in the chat and I'm happily forwarding them to the editors. This might take some time, so maybe I start. Um, I think that Felix was raising his hand, so yeah. If, if I'm allowed to start, I, I yeah, would sure. take the step. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, maybe first of all, uh, for those who don't know me, Felix, my name, I'm from uh, Innsbruck, Austria. And um, yeah, great effort, first of all. I think it's a, it's a great job you guys did. And uh, yeah, definitely looks like a must have for everyone who's uh, a little bit working in the esports industry. And so really, really looking forward to, to have a read on that. Um, I, have, I have two questions, basically. Maybe I, I missed uh, the, the, first, the answer to the first one uh, because I was a little too late. Uh, but who's going to be the publisher? Like, uh, where are you going to pub publish the book? Did you did you mention that or? Yeah, it's it's Rutledge. Ah, okay, sorry. Or then some just, people just pronounce that. Rutledge. I'm sorry. Now, for that. Maybe I just missed it when you when you said it in the in the first couple yeah. of minutes. I, I was a little late. Okay, then uh, forget that question. Sorry for that. Um, and the second one is maybe more um, of interest for also the the, the rest of the audience, um, because I think what you guys did now is that that you wrapped up everything that is kind of there right now regarding esports research. And that is something, in my opinion, pretty unique. I mean, when I think of, of sports sciences, uh, nowadays you have so much science going on in so much different fields and so much different details, which is great. But sometimes, in my opinion, you just lose track because there's just so much that it's really hard to uh, yeah, find your way through all that information that is out there and so the question is is there a plan to like kind of trying to continuing this whole process for like many many years 
so that there will always be this one manual, this, this holy grail of a book, uh, which gives you pretty much an answer to, to yeah, hopefully everything you, you would like to know. Is there like, are there any plans on that or? Yeah, so um, the anticipated shelf life of the book would be about three years, and then we would hope to do a second edition. I think um, that's really dependent on making sure that people are purposeful in purchasing the book mm -hmm. and asking their institutional libraries to also purchase the book to make sure that we're showing Rutledge that this is worth uh, doing a second edition for. But I, I think that would be the anticipated time frame would be about, um, our, you know, start working on it about the two year mark and then uh, trying to get it out about the three year mark from when this one is published. Okay. Yeah. Sounds, sounds Seth, very close. It's worth going over the formats the book is coming out in, right? That it's being yep. released in both physical form and as an ebook. So Rutledge handbooks uh, being massive tend to be a little expensive. Yeah. Uh, so we did try and push really hard to make sure that the ebook would come out and be a more reasonable price from the start. So, so the mean, initial release, set. yeah, the, the, the initial release is hardback and ebook. And then I think after one or two years, uh, Rutledge releases the soft cover, which is a little bit less expensive, but obviously the ebook is less, the least expensive. Yeah. Okay, we are well. Sounds sounds great, and I will definitely push uh, the, the sport department here in Innsbruck to definitely get some hard copies. So uh, I will I will do my best on on that. <laughs> Thank you, Felix, for the two questions. Um, Tobias limited our insight on the future of esports chapter, but I wonder: are there some topics that are not covered yet that you think can be valuable in the future? to add or do you think everything has been addressed although i'm addressing a limitation i want to highlight a great book once again so are there topics missing that you think could be added in future chapters or books maybe that yeah i'm trying to think of um i i would say relating to the future um we're definitely going to be focusing on topics that relate to sustainability of the industry. Um, so that's a little hint about the, the future of esports, but we, you know, um, I, yeah, g give me a second to think about any other, I don't know if anybody else can think yeah, of, but I, we try to go uh, ahead. I, Nico. There are a few, I think, like you said, I think the, I mean, certainly the discussions that we've been having over the past uh, few months, if not longer is, that sustainability, economic, social, environmental sustainability is are important conversations to be having in, in and around esports, but and and but particularly given some of the kind of the political issues that are, are being discussed in and around esports at the moment. I mean, I saw that some as Brian said in the chat, sports washing, you know, issues around kind of the role of money, uh, the kind of political and cultural capital where that money is coming from and like the, the implications that has for what esports looks like going forward. Certainly, you know, certainly there could be a chapter on, on sports washing. Um, but I feel that the the kind of the meta conversation is, is partly around social, economic and environmental sustainability. And there are a lot of issues that can kind of fall into that Um like I say, um, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, technological developments are also going to fit, you know, into that role. I mean, I wrote a few years ago about the role of kind of AI and player support. And, you know, you've got process, like programs like Dota Plus and things like that. And, and, and these th days they play an increasing role in training. And so what's the role of kind of AI and technologies in, 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 in shaping the future of the esports field as well? Esports for elderly people. Yeah, th what we were saying earlier, 37 plus, 37 plus league. I think yeah, I mean, one of the first versions of this outline had like 90 chapters and we had to fight it down from there. So I'm just having flashbacks to our six Zoom meetings last summer where we did that work. There's definitely uh, things that got combined or abbreviated to try and fit within Rutledge's uh, requirements. Sorry, Nico, what did you have? Uh, is what what's actually Tom was mentioning. We just before the colloquium, we were having an ERN board meeting, and we were speaking a lot, a lot about 
the, the news regarding esports uh, in a political way and how different geographical areas are emerging and how governments are you know, trying to push for policies and to uh, use esports as a, a, a soft power tool. And, and it was what I was thinking about. And of course, when we were looking at diversity and uh, esports for people with disabilities, we I'm quite sure that most of you are uh, quite... Um, aware of the different initiatives in Scandinavia with the silver snipers, with the grey gunners, or in Japan with the Matagi snipers, uh, who, which are initiatives for people that are, you know, among 60 years old, and so they are really elderly people. So, and we were joking like two hours ago with Tom about the fact that uh, above 36, maybe sometimes we are a little bit old, but in the, the the Asian games last week, the 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 the, the winner of the the Street Fighter uh, competition tournament is was forty four. So uh, there are some maybe some room for people like us to maybe win a tournament maybe a little bit later. So uh, yeah, this was the idea that 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 I had that I had in mind. But as Amanda mentioned it, the first out outline project that we had was so huge we wanted to address everything we we had to actually uh, choose uh, some specific topics some of them didn't make the cut if i can say it like that and uh, maybe for a second edition there will be um, some topics that will be re-injected that we actually didn't address in the first edition uh, <clears throat> what we try to do is not to be uh, disciplinary uh, to not divide the book by disciplinary field as you can see it it was really topic focused uh we didn't want to make a esports law esports economy esports uh humanities and uh, esports physiology it was really a discussion that we had at the beginning so it was really topic centered and yeah this is it yeah and, and where we like I very much like the outcome of what you did. Um, and if I remember correctly, every chapter, please correct me if that's wrong, has a list of further readings. Correct? Yeah. And discussion questions. So to summarize what you read. Um, is... yeah, there are some highlights. Every chapter has the same frame. Hmm. Maybe that you, you, you can actually explain it a little bit better because we have a template for each chapter. Yeah, we, we had a template for the authors. So they, um, beyond the, the main content, they have the abstract, key highlights, key words, um, definition of key terms that we'll have in a glossary at the end of the book. Uh, they also have a research bite, which is pur purposeful, practical application of their chapter topic, either in a case study or most of the authors decided to do a question and answer interview with a industry um person relating to their chapter topic. Uh, they have discussion questions um, and additional resources that so and we we didn't want to duplicate the reference list. So those additional resources were potential websites or other readings that they recommend that were not cited in their chapter. Um, those are some of the me, main components of each chapter, but we really encourage them to be practical in uh, giving suggestions to the reader of um, how this topic relates in the real world within the industry. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a question, another question in the chat. I think Tom, you read it already um, from Leonardo. Did anyone else read it and wants to respond to it or should I read it aloud? Go ahead and read it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to avoid that. So I have two doubts, uh, one more empirical and one more theoretical. In Brazil, we see that LBGTQ eSport players representatively are kind of associated to the excess of consumption in communities and platforms, specifically when we are talking about live streaming. want to know if something like that is considered in, di in the diversity topic. Yeah? Uh, I can answer that. I don't understand the question. Um, so... I think that what I can say that's covered in the diversity chapter and is issues around 
the, the diversity chapter doesn't specifically cover issues around kind of the role of live streaming and kind of emergent technologies in shaping LGBTQ plus discourse. Um, that is not in the chapter, and that's definitely something that could potentially be included. Um, certainly, there is a chapter also that does talk about live streaming because that's in the media and comm section, if I'm right, Amanda. Um, but again, I don't think that the, it covers the specific issue of LBGTQ+. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that at the moment that's in those kind of chapters. But again, that's something that could easily be included in, um, um, you know, in, in, in kind of in, in future editions. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I'm afraid I don't understand the second part of that two-part question. Maybe, maybe if I understand well, the second part, Leonardo, um... Maybe you, want... you went on. Yeah, I, I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, maybe, for what I understand from the second part, but maybe uh, tell me if I'm wrong, is that some esports is global. There is there is no borders, and organizations are global, like Fnatic, G2, or Loud, or I don't know. But some of them are trying to be more uh, um, geolocalized in a specific territory, in a specific city. And it can be a kind of new uh, revenue source for this organization to uh, have some fundings from the municipality. And this is the idea that you, you got in this question, Leonardo. Yeah, yeah. Especially okay. especially something like that, because it's, it's pretty much about the definition of the ecosystem's uh, theoretical aspect that have mm. this question that is or more... Uh, uh, localized or mm -hmm. delocalized. And mm -hmm. I, I think that studying this, this kind of topics, in, especially in the esports um, ecosystem, would be extremely relevant to consider these two aspects as a merge in the in the esports ecosystem. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I bring this this question to the mm -hmm. to the discussion. That, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm afraid that's in the chapter dedicated to the uh, uh, inventory of the sports ecosystem and how all the stakeholders are linked to each other. The authors did not uh, address the specific question of the localization or not of the, the, the different stakeholders. Uh, so I'm not sure that we are addressing in the book this specific topic, but maybe Thers want to add it something. If you're if you're talking about infrastructure and like server locations and where gameplay is impacted by that, that is definitely covered in the culture sections, especially Oceania discussing um, the impact of that. But um, even in the equipment and infrastructure chapter, they discuss um, that as well. I know that the, that's not totally what you were talking about, but that relates that th those that topic is um, important and and included. And, and that's might be one of those things where um, instead of having a separate chapter, like I put in the chat, somebody who said, hey, you should have a chapter called grassroots esports. Well, you know, we're interested in grassroots collegiate esports and grassroots um, uh, all different types of grassroots. You know, how does grassroots impact things in DEI and higher ed settings? And so that that's those are potentially it's a topic that is covered across multiple chapters. I, um, that's, I guess, the best answer I can give you for that. I think that's also why we have both a global history of esports chapter and the individual cultural ones. Um, a localization chapter was one of the like 90 options we discussed, um, but then we decided to get at it in those individual chapters as well. And it's been really interesting to see how often some of the same games and developers show up as, as significant in regions, even if they're based, for instance, in Europe or the US they still have a really strong president presence in other regions. So that's one of the things that that section deals with a little bit. Yeah, thanks for answering the question. Also, thanks for asking the question, Leonardo. I have another question if someone from the audience has one. So um, I'm interested in, has there been any surprises in terms of satisfying satisfying ways or something negative that they experienced while trying to create this unique book or trying to manage all the reviews and editors on the chapters? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to 
name names, but there's some chapters where we were really hoping that they would add more co-authors and they decided they did not want to. For example, um, people who said they were going to write a chapter uh, didn't follow through. I mean, the typical types of managerial issues you'd run into when you're managing 93, whatever, uh, you saw 125 people interested um, in writing chapters, you know, some people were disappointed they weren't selected to be an author. Um, yeah, so um, those are some of the issues that we've had to, to work through. And I think um, we, again, we've tried to be transparent as, as much as I've ever seen in any uh, academic project. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to add on to that. Yeah, but we had also very good surprises. For example, there are some people that we really wanted to co-author or author a chapter, and we weren't sure that they will be available or they, they will be interested. Uh, for example, on my side, I will only speak for me, but the fact that Jacob Wolf or Tielo Dario Wunsch, uh, I'm yeah. a Star yeah, I'm a StarCraft fan, so Tielo for me, it's kind of, you know, it's a star, uh, someone very famous for, for all the StarCraft fans around the world. So when they accepted Jacob Wolf or, or, or Tielo, for me, it was, yeah, that's great. Really, I really appreciate that. So it was some good surprises too. I was also surprised and impressed at how many reviewers responded. I thought we were going to have to be hounding people to get reviews for chapters, and people were so excited about the project that they sent back reviews on time. As Seth said, some of our chapters got all five invited reviewers back, which I know then our authors had to deal with. Sorry, Ollie. Um, but the the reviews were were very on point. They engaged with what the handbook was about in most circumstances. They provided really specific feedback for our authors. And they came in detailed and on time, which was really great. Yeah, thank you. I'm just trying to order my thoughts on this. But yeah, uh, it was surprising receiving five review comments. It was demotivating on the one hand, but on the other hand, it was really yeah, in, uh, strengthening the chapter and also having us to, to make it more clear. So we are grateful for that, even though it was confusing and surprising the first time a lot, yeah, of, hand, a, a lot of handbooks don't a lot of handbooks don't actually go under peer review either which i think is an important point to consider so yeah. it was also an element that we've introduced into this process because you know we're, we're all committed to producing good science and good esports science um and you know it would have been easier for us not to have done peer review and just to have had people submit chapters and then publish them but the peer review process almost, I won't say 100% of the time, but 99, 98% of the time, someone came back and said that they've revised it and the chapter is just stronger as a result of that, that, that peer review process. So even though it's taken a long time and a lot more work and not everyone enjoyed having all the reviews um, or some reviews in particular, um, the collection as a whole is, is stronger. Um, and, and more informed. I'll give you an example of that in, for, for Ollie. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you who the reviewers were, but in Ollie's section, there's a, it discusses the differences between a you know, clinical psychologist and a, a mental coach and the varying types of um, terminology used for someone who works in that field. And their reviewers came from the United States and Australia and Europe and and they really helped solidify the terminology and the educational background required for those various terminologies globally that um, the initial first draft, um, it made it a lot more clear and it enhanced the, the project um, in that chapter a lot more. So um, I know, uh, I think Laura even said that she showed um, the cha her chapter to, I think her advisor and the advisor said, well, no one's ever written this clearly about the varying roles and the varying educational backgrounds like that is you can't go to a good source to find this and that's sort of what we're hoping to achieve with this project is like there's a lot of chapters that in this book that are not clearly written elsewhere and we're trying to put it all into one place for for everyone yeah i i think our example represents like a lot of chapters within the book and it was hard to to clarify that for while addressing different nationalities, countries, regulations. But I think um, having a collaboration within the 
the team of authors, but also having multiple reviewers and the way you are transparent and open about the chapter chapters and the book itself is really great. But I also can understand that people are sad or disappointed that they are not invited um, in, yeah. in a great project like that, but but that's not, not something <clears throat> we can avoid. So, Yeah, I'll give you an example. We did get somebody's feedback. It was like um, we were biased uh, and they felt that everyone should have written a proposal for each chapter. And I, I'm not opposed to that idea, but we are on a timeline that you know, with us going through all the levels of we required outlines, we required peer review, we required all these for us to then require someone to write a proposal to us to then make that selection that way. It just we just did not have time. And honestly, as an academic, I would hate to spend the time writing a proposal, you know, let's say it's six pages or whatever, and it's highly referenced to, to then not be selected. It's, quote unquote, potentially a waste of time. Um you know, not to say that we, the way we did is the only right way, but that's some of the, one of the critiques that we got. I, yeah. I'm always focusing on the negative, sorry. But if I'm <laughs> hearing and, and remembering correctly, then you invited everyone to provide a, like, outline Correct. of their chapter, and then you decided that, this is similar to yeah. a conference. Yeah. yeah, that person then, yeah, was was offered the opportunity to to be a peer reviewer, and we are recognizing all the peer reviewers in the book as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um. Seems like there is no question within the or in the chat or no hands are raised. Then I would post my last question, which is, can we expect any future projects from your group? Like, is anything planned yet? Uh, are there dreams circulating in your heads? I would say um, we're not as secretive as some other people. And that uh, if we were working on something, you probably would have already seen about <laughs> it. <laughs> I see. The next project will be to, um, you know, uh, be together in the next eSports Research Network conference and to, uh, yeah, have all the authors, the reviewers, and all the editors all together having you know, a good time presenting their new project, their new research project. And uh, we are all spread around the world. And I think that what we are really looking forward is to the next eSports Research Network conference and to to be, you know, physically all together. Yeah, I second that. So do you have any last words? Tom, you unmute yourself. Maybe you want to say something? What was it? I would just say that probably, yeah. I would just say that probably after the last 12 to 18 months, we'll probably need a little bit of time before we embark on the next group project uh, yeah. together, which maybe by the time that we're ready will be uh, the second edition of this book. So, uh, yeah. That's a well-deserved Did break. Toby, do you want to talk about any of the potential upcoming uh, esports research conferences? Uh, yeah, so uh, not everything fixed in stone, but uh, definitely uh, we know that John Germany is planning something in New York. Um, end of March, beginning of April, probably, um, still pending, uh, but there will be something from DRN as a satellite event or something like that. Um, I am also currently working on or planning a little seminar workshop here at my university, um, still in the planning phase, but uh, depending when the New York thingy is, um, I will uh, adapt to it, but probably something around end of April, uh, early May, something around that. Um, so you will see the wonderful summer in Norway. So those are the things. Um, we can talk a bit about it, but uh, there are also several other things we are not yet able to talk about it. Uh, but if that is fixed, we will let you know. Thank you. So moving back to the topic of the eSport, uh, the Moot, I can't pronounce it yet, but Moot Ledge Handbook of eSports. Do you have any last words before I close today's session? 
Good. Just thank everybody who's been involved in the project. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much for presenting the project. Thanks everyone for joining or watching the recorded version of this session. It was a lovely session. Um, I very much enjoyed it. And I think the handbook will make a valuable addition to everyone's bookshelves. So thanks once again and well, maybe PDF files or, or folders. So thanks everyone and have a nice day. See you at the next eSport Research Colloquium. Goodbye.